See, the, how you're about to act. You're saying it's okay when I'm in a difficult situation to make a false promise to get out of that situation. So that would be the first step, to formulate the maxim. And it's important we get that because the categorical imperative only works on maxims. So it's a very general type of reasoning. <clears throat> and if that maxim isn't properly formulated, the categorical imperative really won't work on it. Okay, so you always have to extract that maxim. So think of the maxim as, as your own personal policy um, that's guiding what you're about to do or what you're thinking about doing. Number two, you want to universalize the maxim as a law of nature governing all rational persons so that everyone must act as you propose. Step two, then, is where you universalize the maxim. It's almost like you blow it up. You think of it in terms of a law of nature that not only applies to you as a rational person, but applies to everyone, applies to every rational person. So everyone would act in such a way that you are about to act. So to universalize the false promise example, we could say that everyone does nothing but make false promises. Okay, that maxim has become universalized. It's a law of nature binding every person <clears throat> the same way that the law of gravity binds every person. Three, see if your maxim is even conceivable in a world governed by this law of nature. Step three is really the contradiction test. Kantian ethics, as I said, is very rational. Kant attempted to derive this strictly from reason itself. An action Kant thinks will be immoral if that maxim of your action ultimately leads to a contradiction. Okay, so that step three is really the contradiction test. So the false promise example, Kant would say, does that maxim governing the false promise action, does that lead to a contradiction? If it does, the action is immoral and we shouldn't do it. So note there I say if your maxim fails step three, you have a perfect duty not to act according to it. Okay, so the false promise maxim would, would say if it fails step three, we should never tell a false promise. Okay, let me skip to this side, to this next slide right here. <clears throat> this kind of spells out for you what I'm talking about with the false promise example. So we've looked at the example. Is it permissible to make a false promise to borrow money knowing you can never repay the loan? The maxim would be, whenever you need money that you cannot pay back, make a lying promise to get the loan. Universality. It is impossible for everyone to act according to this maxim. The question would be why. Well, why is it impossible? Well, ultimately, it results in a contradiction. And Kant says that no rational agent can will the maxim as a universal law of nature because a lie can only work if enough people tell the truth to make truthfulness the normal expectation. Okay, Kant didn't say that, but that's paraphrasing what he did say, okay? So if we make telling a lie, a false promise, a universal law of nature, that means that everyone does nothing but lie. But lying only works if enough people tell the truth so that I typically think a person is telling the truth. So the maxim of my action ultimately results in a contradiction. I can't will the maxim of my action to tell a false promise. I can't will that that become a law of nature because in such a world, it would be 
or, or no one would ever believe it. I mean, if everyone does nothing but lie, if no one tells the truth, I could never lie to you to get a loan that I could never repay. So Kant thinks it would be morally wrong to tell a false promise, not because the consequences are bad, not because a world in which everyone did nothing but lie would be a bad world. That would be the case, but for Kant, it's ultimately immoral because it results in a contradiction. I can't will that my maxim be the case as a universal law of nature. Once my maxim takes the form of universality, it would be impossible to act according to that maxim. So I could never do the action. And this really gets to the heart of immorality for Kant. I mean, ultimately, immorality, Kant thinks, is about making exceptions for myself and not for you. Okay, so one set of rules applies to me, but another set would apply to you. I mean, that's really getting at the heart of immorality for Kant. Okay. So anything that result, any maxim that results in a contradiction that violates step three, Kant would say we have a perfect duty not to do it. Okay, so we're going to have two types of duties, perfect duty and an imperfect duty. But let's say an action passes step three. So we move to step four. Ask yourself if you could or would rationally will to act on your maxim in this world. If our maxim fails step four, we have an imperfect duty to act or not to act. Okay, so we have some discretion here, and we'll, give, we'll talk about some examples that Kant gives regarding an imperfect duty. Only if your maxim passes all four steps is the action morally permissible. Okay, so the big picture to see here, number one, we formulate a maxim. Number two, we universalize the maxim. Three, we see if the maxim is, is logical. If it results in a contradiction, we have a perfect duty not to do it. So the false promise example fails step number three. It results in a contradiction. I can't will that my maxim become a law of nature consistently. So I have a perfect duty not to tell a false promise. Or stated positively, I have a perfect duty to tell the truth. If the maxim fails step four, we have an imperfect duty to act or not to act. So let's take a look here in a little greater detail about this concept of duty. So going back a couple previous slides, we said a good will is a will that acts according to duty. And Kant defines duty as acting out of reverence for the moral law. So one does their duty when they act out of respect or reverence for the moral law. For Kant, there's, four, uh, there's two different types of duties, a perfect duty and an imperfect duty. And he applies these duties to ourselves and to other people. So we have a perfect duty to ourselves and a perfect duty to other people. We also have an imperfect duty to ourself and an imperfect duty to other people. Now, these duties, we should note, are derived from the categorical imperative. <clears throat> That's why the categorical imperative is so important um, in Kant's ethical theory, because it really reveals to us what we have a duty to do. Okay, So moral duties are generated by the moral law. And there's four different, or two different types of duties, perfect and imperfect. And whether it's a perfect or imperfect duty depends upon whether it violates step three or four of the categorical imperative. 
Okay, so what's the difference between a perfect and an imperfect duty? A perfect duty for Kant is something that admits of no exception. <clears throat> it's something you have to do every time, case closed, no exceptions. Okay, it's completely absolute. We have a perfect duty to Kant for Kant to tell the truth. No exceptions. And as the video pointed out and Kant talked about, even 